Thank you very much for your generous introduction. I'm very glad and happy to be here, especially on such a great day. Uh, we were just talking before that that I had the chance to live a couple, a few months in Belfast, and from there, I knew that the kind of joke about Irish weather is that there are only two possible weather forecasts. One is that it's raining now, and the other one it will rain soon. So <laughs> Dublin today disproves the uh, millinery wisdom of the Irish people, uh, and I'm very glad uh, with it. Um, I'm very honored to be here also speaking after Jim O'Neill, uh, um, with whom we seem that we will have probably some kind of a, of a discussion. And part of the reason I'm here is that basically I'm not an expert on the BRICS or on China, India, and Brazil, but I've spent some time, uh, well, quite some time researching Russia and the Eastern neighborhood, uh, the post-Soviet space and EU relations with, um, with, um, with Russia and the post-Soviet space. So I come more from that perspective. Also, um, I just watched yesterday Jim O'Neill's presentation here about the BRICS, where he basically said that the most often question he gets when he speaks about the BRICS is when will the R be out of the acronym? Uh, and when he defended this uh, by giving some financial economic statistics, approving the point that Russia is still economically a BRIC. Uh, I come from a slightly different perspective, and basically I think that over the years, BRIC has acquired not just an economic dimension to it, but also a political dimension, a partly a political ambition to be and to represent these new centers of power, and therefore the threshold upon we should judge whether countries are BRIC and whether BRIC exists as such is not just economic and financial statistics, but also how they perform in political terms and uh, what the interaction between these countries is. So this is a bit my perspective, more of a political and a foreign policy analysis perspective rather than an economic one. And uh, some of the things we've been working on recently ended up in this report called Dealing with a post brick Russia. Uh, there are some copies, but of course you can also find it online, and it basically raises some of these things. And the starting point, in a sense, is that... Um, we looked at Russia's foreign policy self-perception in many ways, and basically the main conclusion is that Russia is post brick And by saying this, uh, I mean the way Russia perceives itself as a global center of power. Now, if you go a few years ago uh, in Moscow and you followed the foreign policy debates and the economic debates, you see a lot of ambition, a lot of expectations of Russia being on a clear geostrategic and geoeconomic growth trajectory around 2007 before the economic crisis Moscow was full of uh, expectations that the ruble will become a global reserve currency Putin was uh, saying publicly that Russia will by now become one of the te top 10 economies in the world but its GDP would overtake the GDPs of the United Kingdom or France so you had a kind of very positive outlook and very high expectations about the re-emergence of Russia as a global center of power. This, of course, spilled over into uh, Russia's foreign policy. Many of you remember the Munich speech, the expectation that Russia now will be able to reassert a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space, that it could withstand and its foreign policy was directed to a large extent on kind of keeping in check uh, American power primarily, there was talk of a political and geopolitical rapprochement with China. So you had basically the debate of a rising power. What happened with the economic crisis, and uh, I, I think yeah, particularly in Ireland, but in most of the European Union, you had basically the bubble or the expectations of foreign policy ambitions has bust inside the European Union. Uh, but also you had a relatively similar process, less accentuated, but relatively similar in Russia, with the debate now moving into more of a pessimistic uh, vein um, on both Russian domestic policies and Russian foreign policy. Oh, in a sense, if we go back to statistics, uh, the very notion of BRIC actually in the last 10 years, Russia performed in economic terms better on average as average GDP growth than Brazil is. But still, over, over a kind of long-term tra trajectory, my personal feeling is that, uh, in a sense, the kind of BRIC countries are probably meeting somewhere on, at the same point 
uh, around this time in their trajectories as powers, as regional powers, but fundamentally the direction of movement of these trajectories is different. So what you have today in Russia is basically a debate uh, and fears of... Uh, of Brezhnevization, which emerged from the idea that Putin would uh, is likely to stay on or will try to stay on until 2024 for two more presidential terms. You also have a pretty neg pessimistic outlook in terms of economic and money flows. And last year, uh, something like $70 billion were kind of taken out of Russia's capital outflow, which showed some underlying uncertainties around, uh, around the way uh, primarily Russian businessmen see the development of the country. You also have growing political, part, you have growing political tensions. And of course, part of the last decade was that this kind of growing consensus around Putin was also manifested itself in very high support for, for, for the current authorities in the Kremlin. But this support has been partly shattered. Um, what a kind of key element of this is that basically Putin lost the grand narrative which he was using to mobilize support for him personally. If you look at, uh, at the way the 99-2000 election cycle when Putin came into power, basically Putin stood for a number of very salient issues for the Russian public. Back then it was the fight against terrorism and the kind of desire to reintegrate and ensure territorial integrity of Russia, meaning at that time we were in Chechnya. In 2003-2004, uh, Putin's main selling point in ideational terms was the fight against oligarch, oligarchs, the imprisonment, uh, imprisonment of Khodorkovsky in late 2003. And basically at that time, Putin stood in the views of the Russian public for cleaning up the economic system, for fighting corruption and pushing the oligarchs slightly further away from uh, political influence. In 2007-2008 election cycle, uh, you had basically the message coming from the Kremlin being that Russia is standing up from its knees, that Russia is re-becoming a, a global center of power, which again had some salience. What happened with the latest round of elections, and uh, of course you've noticed the massive protests uh, by middle classes primarily in Russia, but part of the context that Putin finds himself in is that there basically there is no big idea and grand projet that Putin is standing for at this stage. Of course, he partly won the elections through cash promises and handouts to, to various social groups, but it's not clear at this stage whether basically he has a new grand, a big project to offer Russia, and some of his old ideas have, are not as salient as they were. So if you look at, the, for example, North Caucasus, the situation there is that there is now a new tide of Russian nationalism. So in a sense, if 10 years ago the main message of Russian nationalism was, I would die for the Caucasus, today the new wave of Russian nationalism is mobilized behind the slogan of, of stop feeding the Caucasus, which is a kind of proxy reference to not necessarily wanting to keep uh, this region as part of Russia over the uh, midterm. And you have, for example, according to some poll, 62% of Russians uh, saying that they support the slogan of, of stop feeding the Caucasus. So you have this kind of changing perceptions of and undermining of the main core narrative ideas that Putin had. If you go into Putin being associated with the fight for oligarchs, Today, it's very clear that there's been, besides putting Khodorkovsky in prison, there hasn't been a systematic attempt to sideline oligarchs. On the contrary, to, in many ways, uh, richer Russian grew richer. And if you go into the Forbes, uh, uh, <clears throat> into the Forbes ratings of billionaires in the world, you'd see that Moscow today is home for the highest number of billionaires in the world. And this despite the fact that, of course, the Russian economy is much smaller than the economies of China or the United States. So in this sense, Moscow has more billionaires than Shanghai, Beijing, or New York, or London, for that matter. Which basically, and Russia in the global list of, and Russia as a country is on the, in the third place as, as kind of the country, residence country of billionaires. Which for some people is an element of pride, but actually for most Russians is an element of how unfair 
non-redistributionist and basically skewed the economic system is. So in this sense, Putin is also not credible when he, if he would try to uh, kind of replay some of his old ideas. Um, in this report, and then you, you have, these are kind of the personality-related weaknesses that undermine Russia's brickness. Um, but then you have also some structural issues. And this, in this report on page 20, maybe if you... Uh, we basically comp compiled a list of where Russia stands according to various global indexes. So we went to Transparency International, uh, the kind of Davos Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report. And just to give you a sense of uh, on which places Russia stands in these uh, ratings. For example... On global competitiveness, Russia is the 66th place in the world on a par with Sri Lanka and behind Vietnam. On the failed state index, Russia is on the 82nd place in the world on a par with Algeria. On infrastructure quality, Russia is the 100th place in the world right behind Mali. On air travel quality, it's in the same category actually right behind Nigeria. On the bribery index, it's right behind Mongolia. On quality of corporate boards, it's behind Egypt. Um, on police re reliability, is in a group with Mauritania. On life expectancy, is with Pakistan. And on corruption perception, is 154th place with Papua New Guinea. Also, <clears throat> there was a lot of talk a year ago, and still, about the Arab Spring and that part of the um, underlying uh, kind of factors which fueled the Arab Spring was the corruption. And if you go to the Transparency Index and you look at the Corruption uh, corruption Perception Index, you'd see that, for example, Tunisia was the 59th place in 2010 under Ben Ali. Uh, Egypt was the 98th place on corruption, and Russia is 154th place on corruption. So you have some very serious underlying issues which haven't been solved and which constrained Russia's capacity to, uh, to become the emerging power that uh, it's, it wants to become and also to, to benefit fully from this economic growth trajectory that the other BRIC countries are finding themselves. Also, part of this is, you know, if you go into the statistics, for, for example, and we talk about the North Caucasus, one interesting piece of statistics is that in 2009, there's been more Russian policemen killed in the North Caucasus than U.S., servicemen were killed in Iraq. Um, so you have these underlying problems, which they might not necessarily uh, end up in the news, but still they seriously affect the way and Russia's capacity to be a brick. I'll just kind of quickly talk about the way this influences Russian foreign policy on two or three key dimensions. One is the post-Soviet space. And Part of it is that basically uh, Russia is now much more focused on, on asserting its influence in parts of the post-Soviet space. I, I think partly the paradox here is that in the 90s, when Russia was weaker in economic and political terms, actually Russia was more influential in the post-Soviet space than it was in the last decade, uh, when Russia became stronger. And part of the reason for that is not so much just the economic and state capacity of Russia, but also what the other centers of power did. And what happened was that Russia drastically eroded, uh, that China drastically eroded Russian influence uh, and is eroding Russian influence in Central Asia, and the European Union uh, is doing gradually the same in the Western post-Soviet states, primarily South Caucasus, Moldova, Ukraine, and um, and Belarus. It doesn't mean that Russia is not influential, is very influential in many of these countries as the most influential foreign policy actor, but is not as influential as it was even in the 90s. So if you look at trade statistics, today all of the Central Asian states trade more with China than with Russia, except Uzbekistan. And there's a relatively similar picture happens with the other post-Soviet states where the EU is a bigger trading partner to all these states than, uh, than Russia is, except Belarus. And on Ukraine, it's basically balancing around 30% external trade for the EU and 30% for Russia. You also have some interesting... So, in a sense, what happens is that the foreign... The EU and China primarily, but also the United States, deny Russia a monopoly over these countries. 
But partly also what happens is that basically Russian influence in these places and this influence of other powers partly kind of cancel each other out. So you have the rise of a kind of greater room for autonomy for these states. Russia is also not very willing to invest too much into reasserting a sphere of influence. I think it was very interesting uh, three years ago, almost three years ago in Kyrgyzstan when basically Russia refused to send peacekeepers in. <clears throat> they didn't want to pay for, with the lives of its peacekeepers just to stabilize a country which it perceives as being, you know, preferably in the sphere of influence but, of Russia, but not with a very high cost of a costly security commitment like Russia did in Tajikistan <coughs> in, the 90, in the early 90s. So in this sense, Russia is also streamlining and rationalizing what it wants to uh, spend as, a, uh, as kind of resources and commitment in the post-Soviet space. Another interesting and important development is what is also the kind of Turkmenistan pipeline to, to, to China, or a gas pipeline, which basically denied denies Russia a monopoly of uh, transit and influence over the energy resources in the region. Um, if, given that it's with the starting point of the discussion is that we are having a discussion of, uh, about the BRICS, I'll speak ab talk about a bit about the Russia-Chinese relations. And while researching for this report, we also went to China to see how China perceived Russia. And I think two jokes were interesting in capturing um, how the kind of China-Russian dynamics sometimes plays out. One is the Russian joke, and the Russian joke basically says that in Russia, optimists learn English, pessimists learn Chinese, and realists learn how to operate a Kalashnikov. <laughs> um, and then we went to China and we started to ask uh, Chinese experts, um, foreign, foreign policy thinkers, how, whether they see Russia as a brick. And at some point, um, one of our Chinese interlocutors, after kind of, uh, the kind of introductory 40 minutes of uh, uh, MFA website lines, basically um, said that, look, you ask me whether uh, Russia is a brick, I'll tell you a joke we have in China. And basically, the joke is that it's a brick summit, and the presidents, the leaders of the brick countries, discuss for several days on when will their currencies become global reserve currencies. Uh, they can't arrive to a kind of proper planning and conclusions, so the Indian, they decide to go to God and ask him. So Mohammed Singh go to, goes to God and asks, when will, God, please tell me, when will the uh, rupee become a global reserve currency? He comes back to his colleagues, he's crying. They ask him, what happened? He says that, um, well, God told me that I will not learn to uh, live to see that. Then you have uh, Dilma Rousseff going to God, comes back, crying. Her colleagues ask, what happened? She says that God told me I will not leave to see the real becoming a global reserve currency. The same happens with uh, uh, Jiang Zemin, um, with Hu Jintao, and uh, he comes back crying. Then Medvedev goes to God, he comes back, he's not crying, but looks rather puzzled. So he say, they ask him what happened. Well, God started to cry. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you, you had... You have a very changing dynamic. If five, seven years ago, this story, also in the West, was of a Chinese-Russian alliance, maybe a BRIC alliance, standing up to the West, you know, to U.S. arrogance. Uh, this was a very kind of important united factor for, for Russia-China. You also had growing trade. For example, in 2010, China overtook Germany as the biggest trading partner for Russia with $55 billion uh, of trade turnover. You also had very close military links and China was basically 63% of Chinese, uh, of Russian mil arms exports were sold to China. Also from a kind of Chinese uh, strategic perspective, they would say that Russia is our safest border. Uh, we have issues in the kind of the Chinese West, to the West of China, with the kind of Greater Middle East, in the South is India, and in the West and Southwest you have the kind of US encirclement. And from a Chinese perspective, Russia is basically the safest and most stable border, and it's definite that they want to keep it this way. Uh, also, you had very high expectations of growing energy trade. Russia's interest would be to diversify away to China so that it can play two markets against each other, meaning the EU and China, when it comes to selling um, 
to selling energy resources. So you had a very strong underlying basis for a rapprochement between Russia and China, which happened. And in the last decade, Russia-China relations have been better than you know, pretty much ever before, except for some uh, small moments of uh, niceties between Stalin and Mao, which uh, have been disproved by history. But now I think the dynamic is very different. Part, part of the explanation is the perceptions of Western decline, uh, with especially with U.S. kind of retrenchment of its foreign policy ambitions, with the collapse of uh, EU foreign policy ambition, or at least stagnation, there is less of a kind of push factor for Russia-China relations. Also for Russia, its vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis China is much greater in this sense of, and in a sense if Russia, if China five or seven years ago, China for Russia was a growing market, an, an emerging market and a kind of emerging economic partner, now Russia is an emerging power, which, which is a completely di different game. The power asymmetry between Russia and China is also rising. Even with the BRICS, I mean, from a Russian perspective, for Russia is much more comfortable to deal with the Chinese as part of a quadrilateral forum such as BRIC. And it's actually much more difficult uh, to deal with China in a bilateral relationship. On energy, you had the Chinese being pretty ruthless in extracting, uh, you know, deals and gas and oil prices from Russia at a moment of weakness. You had uh, the Chinese uh, lending Rosneft and uh, Transneft, Russian oil, state-owned oil companies, $25 billion in exchange for during the economic crisis when they needed to balance shit. Um, uh, in exchange for oil supplies for the next 20 years. And if you basically divide the uh, costs, the, uh, the 25 billion to the amount of oil they agreed to supply, you get on average that Russia will be paid something like $50, $60 per barrel, which is much cheaper than what it, uh, much less than it gets on the open market. So uh, you, you also have a pretty difficult relations and negotiations over gas. And apparently the Chinese are much more ruthless than the Europeans in extracting uh, a, cost, a, a cost for gas which would suit them. So the kind of rosy expectations of seven, eight years ago haven't been matched. When you have another interesting dynamic, for example, happens on arms trade. Uh, and just a few years ago, China was the biggest um, importer of Russian arms. Today, Algeria and Vietnam import more Russian weapons than, than China does. So you got a kind of over two years, you got a collapse of Chinese orders of Russian arms. In a sense, also, if you go to the Russian military doctrine, you see that NATO is mentioned 17 times and China is not mentioned once. But it's more of a kind of a feeling, perhaps, of the elephant in the room there than actually real strategic decision making. Um, also, if you look at the oil partnership and we go into kind of interesting statistics, you'd also see that China is importing more oil from Angola, Iran and Doman than it does from Russia. So a lot of the kind of talk of Russian Chinese rapprochement is, is a bit overblown. There is definitely a good political dynamic, but, but the, the underlying basis of this relationship is also a bit different. We were also, while doing research for this report, we interviewed an American uh, diplomat in Beijing. We asked him, basically, if the parallel he, said, uh, he came up with, he said that, look, basically the U.S.-China relationship is like a pyramid. It's very thick at the bottom. We have a lot of people-to-people -people contacts, a huge trade, huge businesses, uh, but the political relations are very bad. Uh, whereas with Russia, you get a hollow pyramid where mm. the political relations are very good, better than uh, with pretty much most of other China's big power partners. But actually, there is very little in terms of re relatively little in terms of trade and intensity of contacts to support this pyramid. A couple of words about EU Russia, and I'll stop uh, here. Also, the story <clears throat> of a kind of changing Russian foreign policy then, dynamic also happens in relations with the European Union. Uh, just five, six years ago, Russia emerged as the most divisive foreign policy issue for the European Union since the days of Donald Rumsfeld and the Iraq War. Uh, we wrote a, a paper back then called Power Audit of EU-Russia Relations, where we counted that Russia had disputes, bilateral disputes with 14 EU member states over different issues, from trade to 
uh, human rights to you know Estonian uh, war mem- memorials for war soldiers and the Litvinenko affair in the UK. Uh, and basically, back then, the story in the EU-Russia interaction was that, uh, on the one hand, Russia was engaging with some EU member states in bilateral deals, primarily with Germany, Italy, France, strong energy partnerships, a lot of political and high-level symmetry and interaction. On the other hand, Russia was also uh, engaged in several disputes with many EU member states, not just in Central Europe. Uh, and this put a lot of strain on EU foreign policy unity. And Russia was a constant kind of source of bad news for, for EU foreign policy. And it was also a source of big mistrust between EU member states. At some point, you even had the Polish foreign minister practically on the record saying that the Germans were a Russian Trojan horse inside the European Union. And now the, the dynamic has changed dramatically. Just in December, the Polish and German foreign ministers wrote together a joint letter to their EU colleagues asking to reconsider relations with Russia in view of Putin's return to the presidency. Um, and there's basically much fewer disputes. Part of it is a reconsideration of the Russian approach to the European Union, but part of it is the European Union solving some of its uh, vulnerabilities related to, to this relationship and far, some of these underlying issues which made the EU so disunited. So in the recent years, the EU invested a lot in building interconnectors between Central European states, which are dependent on energy supplies from Russia. You also, the US, Russia reset also opened the way for countries like Poland and Lithuania to reconsider and, and kind of moderate their approach to Russia. But you also got the Germans being a bit more disappointed with the way things were going in Russia. So, in a sense, you got a move towards the center on states which were very anti-Russian a few years ago and on states which were very sympathetic to Russia. Uh, Around more of a kind of pragmatic and um, cold-blooded consensus on Russia. It was also interesting... It was kind of not very well noted, but one of the last outstanding issues Russia had in in its negotiations to the WTO uh, in mid last year was basically a very tough German approach on Russia, where Germany basically wasn't accepting what the Russians uh, were offering in terms of taxes for car exports. So you got a kind of much more cold-blooded approach also (coughs) from Germany, which created more of a united dynamic inside the European Union. But overall... Part of the explanation for this more stable relationship is, as I mentioned, is that basically both Russia and the EU have less, fewer foreign policy ambitions. The European Union, if 10 years ago the European Union hoped that Russia will perhaps become one day like a small Poland, like a large Poland, today the EU is basically treating Russia as a small China, a country you do business with, you engage, but you don't really expect to change. So there is this kind of soul-searching and the way the economic crisis hit the EU is also playing a role in this relative normalization of relations. I'll stop here um, and I will happily respond to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, You have raised...